Merrick. Great. Thank you. You want to turn the talk? Yes, I wouldn't clap. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for inviting me, John. Um, thank you all for coming to listen to me. So just a bit about myself, um, so you know where I am, my background. Um, I started out as an applied mathematician in the 1970s. I was studying waves and I was looking at wave power. Uh, some of you, well, I think most people are old enough to remember the 1970s oil crisis. Um, so alternative power is quite a popular thing. Uh, now this is going to be a political statement, so I apologize for upsetting anybody. A wonderful woman came, called Margaret Thatcher came to power in 79 and said we've got all this north to your old, what possible use could alternative energy be? So she cut, shut down all the alternative energy research. So I had to go and get a different job, which is how I ended up being an oceanographer. <laughs> um, okay. It wasn't my original plan. So I ended up at the um, place called the Institute of Oceanographic Sciences, where John was working at the time. And now I'm at the National Oceanography Centre in uh, Southampton. I've got interest in uh, rapid climate change. I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, I've been involved working with uh, ESA and NASA on using satellites, ESA is the European Space Agency, um, looking at uh, the oceans from space. I've got an interest in the effects of physics and biology, um, the Agulhas and Madagascar current systems which are around the tip of South Africa, waves and rogue waves, rogue waves being unexpected in large waves. And I've also done a couple of other things. Um, I was part of the British National Space Centre for a, a few years. And I was also associate director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion in Cambridge for a few years. So fairly very background. So I like this picture because you can't really see any land. <laughs> and really, we not we don't live on the earth; we live on the ocean. And that's uh, as an oceanographer, I think that's really interesting. Uh, you can just possibly make out some land here and up here. But if you approach the planet from uh, the Pacific Ocean side, you wouldn't know that there was any land at all, because well, most of it's the islands. So my talk, as John said, falls into two parts. Um, there will be a uh, first part is about the ocean's role in climate generally, and then I'm going to talk, focus more specifically on the Atlantic Ocean and its role in our climate. Uh, so this is one of the cruises uh, deploying uh, instruments uh, over the back of the ship, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the ocean's role in climate. I'm sure you're all aware that we're pumping lots of CO2 in, uh, into the atmosphere with coal, gas, oil, um, and that is changing climate. So this is a, a very well-known graph. Um, a, a guy called Keeling started making the measurements way back in the 50s and his son is now carrying on the measurements. I'm not even sure that he's alive anymore but uh, yes, yes. he's still alive. You know? yeah, okay. But his son is now responsible for the measurements and uh, you can see that the fraction of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million has gone from 320 to almost 420 um, since the 60s and it was about uh, 218 pre-industrial days. Um, last time 400 parts per million was exceeded was 3 million years ago, when there weren't any human beings like us on the planet. Um, there were humanoid hominids, I think that's the right word. Um, so uh, you know, CO2 is rising because we're burning oil, gas and coal, and it's um, making the global temperatures go up. And everybody sort of, sort of thinks that's something novel, but actually 19th century scientists knew that. They did the calculations way back in the 19th century, I think about 1827, somewhere around there. That was the first sort of calculation of this effect. So we know that adding CO2 to the atmosphere warms the atmosphere. Just to prove it's not a modern thing, this is from the Rodney Alton Tier Times. I think he's in New Zealand. Um, and it talks about coal consumption affecting climate, and it talks about how how many billions tons of coal are being built and how much CO2 it's adding to the atmosphere. The effect may be considerable in a few centuries. The only thing they got wrong was that it's not a few centuries, it's a few decades. But um, they knew about this effect. So there's nothing new about this um, and the theory, the theory of global warming is well understood in terms of the general uh, rise of temperatures. So here is a graph. There are one, two, three, four, five different groups who trying to work out what the global temperatures are going back in time to sort of uh, the uh, 19th century, uh, different curves, they all agree and the temperatures rising. There are times where it seems to have gone down a bit. This was the so-called hiatus in the 2000s, which obviously didn't do very much, it's kind of rising. You could claim there's a bit of a hiatus now. One person claims it's going down because you can see the peaks are slightly lower. 
for your madness. Um, the, the interesting thing about this graph is that um, the Berkeley Earth people, um, they're a bunch of very bright physicists, including Saul Perlmutter, who's a Nobel Prize winner. They said all these climate scientists can't have got this right. They can't have, you know, climate scientists, they don't do these things well. You need to do some real physics on this and work it out. So they went away and did it all, got the data, processed it with club of um, approaches, and they got exactly the same curve. Um, so as a climate scientist, you're not quite as ignorant as some of we were thought to be. But basically, all the estimates agree, particularly in the modern era when we have lots of observations. The reason things get more uncertain as you go into the past is that there are fewer observations, and you have to do more um, smoothing and interpolation to get a, a global temperature. As you can see, the temperature's risen from, and this is all relative to 1981, 2010, um, average, so you can see it's gone up by over a degree um, in this period. Um, the 10 hottest years on record are all since 2010, so uh, we are in the hottest period uh, in terms of recorded temperatures. Um, 2022 last year was I think, the sixth hottest year, 2016 was the hottest, with 2020 uh, close behind. So, oceans and climate, so that's just why we care. Um, so water has a high thermal capacity, that means it can hold a lot of heat. Um, and the top three meters of the ocean hold as much heat as the entire atmosphere. And the oceans are four kilometers deep on average, so you can stuff a lot of heat into the ocean um, without raising its temperature very much. Um, and the other thing is the ocean modifies the climate over long periods of time, it's absorbing heat but it's also moving heat, and it's giving heat back up to the atmosphere, so it interacts with the atmosphere. So in the North Atlantic, which is our sort of backyard, um, it's releasing a petawatt um, of heat continuously to the atmosphere. That's 30,000 times the average output of all the UK power stations put together. And it's actually what gives us our relatively mild winter climate, so I'll come back to that later. So it's important to note that the ocean is really important in the climate system. So we've been warming the Earth, where's the heat going? So this is air, land, sea, life. 7% of the extra heat that we've got has gone into that. 93% of the heat that's due to the CO2 has gone into the oceans. It hasn't raised the ocean temperatures hugely. It is detectable now that the ocean temperatures are going up. But because of the high thermal heat capacity, uh, the oceans can absorb all the heat. So the bit that we feel, the atmospheric, it down here, that's what's warming the air, and there's another bit in there you can just about see, which is the bit that's melting all the ice caps. That's a very small percentage of the total heating that's happened to the Earth. So if we hadn't got an ocean, we'd have overheated quite rapidly. This is just an update of that plot to a more recent times, but it basically gives you the same message. The ocean, which is the blue bit, uh, is absorbing most of the heat. The land and the atmosphere, oh, sorry, the ice, which is the grey, and the uh, atmosphere, which is the purple, absorbing very little of the heat. And that's what's giving us our temperature rise. Even that little bit of extra heat is warming the atmosphere very quickly. So the bottom line of all this is that that has an effect on what's going on in the ocean. So plankton, which is the bottom of the food chain in the ocean, and fish are temperature sensitive. Uh, I was in Iceland a few years ago, and they were worried about their cod moving outside their 200 mile limit, it's a big part of their economy. It wasn't clear whether the cod were moving because the cod are temperature sensitive or because of the plankton on which they feed the temperature. But anyway, they were concerned about losing some of their cod stocks because once they're outside the 200 mile limit, anybody can fish them. Um, so there are uh, implications, economic implications. Sea level is rising, I'll come back to that point. And hurricane formation. Hurricanes draw their energy from the ocean. So if the ocean is warmer, hurricanes can gain more heat and, and energy and therefore become stronger. So that seems to be what's happening. There aren't more hurricanes, but there are stronger hurricanes because there's more energy available for them to grow and develop. Um, a classic picture is the uh, polar bear on the melting ice. And um, that's what we're seeing in the uh, Arctic. The sea ice is melting. So the lowest extent was so far has been actually in 2012. Um, which is, this is measured from satellite in space. Um, September, uh, the end of the summer is when the sea ice is its uh, lowest. 
so this uh, red line is the median value uh, in, the, in the sort of late uh, 20th century and this is what was actually happening uh, in 2012 and has been happening similarly since um, and of course this opens up the northwest passage through and people are already talking about sending ships through there and also drilling for oil and all sorts of other things um, drilling for oil is probably not the greatest idea but anyway. So this is, the, this is the sort of same thing as an annual graph between January and December. The grey area is what was happening sort of 1981 to 2010 with some uncertainty or sort of um, interquartile ranges. So the sort of range and 2012 is this one, uh, this one is 2022 and 2023 is just beginning here. So the sea ice extent is much lower because of the warming, and obviously that affects things like the polar bear hunting up ice. So the sea level is rising, um, so this is a plot of sea level, again, because I'm a satellite person, this is using satellite data. We've had satellites up there in, from 1993, which can measure the height of the ocean to a millimetric accuracy from 800 kilometers up in space. The advantage of them is they give you a global picture um, Normally, we would measure sea level using tight gauges around the coast, which doesn't tell you what's going on in the open ocean. So this is the total uh, sea level rise over that period. There's various um, uh, other ways of trying to calculate it. So these two things add up to this, and basically shows that the satellites are measuring the right thing. That's uh, to do with um, uh, expansion um, and also addition of mass from the melting ice caps. And what appears to be happening is that if you look at the 20th century, there's sea level rising at 1.7 millimetres per year globally. Uh, in to 1993 onwards, it was about 3.3, and 2013 is 4.4. There's some debate as to whether the sea level rise is accelerating, but people think it probably is. So the sea level is going up past that. If you want to go back before 1993, you have to go to tide gauges. So the satellite data is on the red line. Um, the tide gauge data goes back to 1900 and you can see the sea level has increased by about uh, 20 centimetres, so it's 20 centimetres, and it's continuing to increase. <coughs> and this is a, a real concern for people. Um, for example, uh, if you look at Bangladesh, which is very low lying, um, you know, the prediction is that there will be one metre sea level rise within the next half of many years, certainly by the end of the century maybe sooner if it's <coughs> accelerating. Within that contour, about 10, men, 10 million people live, they live there because it's fertile and you can grow stuff. Um, so you know, even a one metre sea level rise would displace 10 million. And a recent study, well it's 2021, they reckon that up to 410 million people are at risk from sea level rise because a lot of people live uh, in low-lying areas. If you think about London and the centre of London and why we have the Thames Bar is because uh, if the water levels go up, um, central London could flood. So there's lots of people at risk um, around the world. The thing is, it's compounded. So that was a sorry, that picture is pure, purely thinking in terms of sea level. Of course, you get things like storm surges, where um, uh, weather systems cause uh, the water to flood onto the land in a storm surge. Um, and the reason the Thames Barge was built was because of a North Sea storm surge in 1953 that actually killed people. Um, but this is a calculation for 2050 uh, of the Bangladesh area, if it was affected not just by sea level, but by storm surges and other processes that can uh, lead to inundation. And this is a much bigger area, including you know, places like Dakar and Kolkata, big cities. Um, so we're not just worried about sea level, but there are other things uh, that could cause effects. Just to bring it right home, I thought I'd do so fast. Um, I live up here by the Highfield University campus. <laughs> I think I'm relatively safe. The Ocean Village, where the Oceanography Centre is, <laughs> it's, it, it is not such a great position. So maybe uh, whoever uh, decided to put it there maybe made, didn't make the best choice. But it, 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 you know, potentially, there's large areas of local. It's not as bad in somewhere like the UK because. There are flat bits in the UK, but not many people live there. I don't know how many people live around the wash, but not that many. Um, so the other thing is, um, it's not just um, about um, 
uh, warming the oceans, the oceans actually absorb carbon dioxide. <coughs> and about 26% of what we've uh, put into the atmosphere as human beings have been absorbed into the ocean. 43% stays uh, in the atmosphere, and that's what causes the warming. Um, and the rest goes into the terrestrial biosphere plants uh, on land that absorb it by growing. And in terms of ocean this causes the ocean to be acidic. Um, and the uh, ocean acidification, the pH has decreased from 8.21 to 8.1. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's not a, not a linear scale, so it's actually about a 25% increase in acidity. And this um, affects things like coral reefs um, because of the temperature rise and acidification. Uh, the coral reefs are made of calcium carbonate, and the temperature rise there. Um, Symbiotic, there's little plankton that live inside the corals that should give them the colour. If the temperature rises too much, the corals expel the plankton and you get bleaching, which is what we've seen in the Great Barrier Reef. So it's never having a beautiful, um, diverse ecosystem based on the coral reef. You end up with the desert, essentially. Um, so that's, um, that's, let's see where we go. We'll stop there for a minute. Right. Just want to make one more point. I haven't got it in my slides, but there's also an issue about oxygen in the ocean. The global changes in temperature in the ocean and changing the way the water is stratified with depth, so ground temperature changes with depth. And that's leading to problems with oxygen in certain parts of the ocean. I haven't got a plot of that, I've got some of that, I didn't agree with it at all. And that's affecting the large, um, larger fish uh, and things like sharks and dolphins, which need a lot of oxygen because there's less oxygen in the water. So that's another consequence. So this is my sort of commercial break and then we'll have some questions. You ought to stop fishing in the ice like that. The size of that hole is causing climate change. How do you figure that out? Well, you've been fishing like that for as long as I can remember and climate change is happening so that must be causing it. No, 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 that's not causing climate change. Climate change is caused by fishing with synthetic lines like that one you've got. No, I don't think that's it. I think it's your position. See, you're facing east. You need to not be facing east. Not be facing east? That sounds a bit far-fetched. I think it's the blue hat you're wearing that's causing climate change. My blue hat? Yeah, it's clear. Well, maybe not, but what else could possibly be causing climate change? Hmm. Maybe it's the humans. The humans? Yeah. No, 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 no. Do you think for one moment that they would allow that to happen to us? Oh, it's got to be the hats then. Yeah, it must be the hats. Great. So I'm going to stop there and take some questions, and then we'll talk a bit more about the Atlantic and the Florida plants. Right. We have one right on the front row here. As you probably know, Donald Trump is the first person to say, all of you, your data is rubbish. What is the answer to your question about such a gentleman's well, statement? Well, <laughs> if you want to dismiss all of that, I mean, I think one answer is the, the um, Berkeley Earth people. You know, they thought that maybe we put it all wrong, and, they, and they're bright physicists, they haven't got no political axe to grind. Um, and they basically went away and redid all that and came to the same answer. So, you, you know, you can't, if somebody really doesn't want to believe, you can't convince them. I and mean, my, my um, experience of trying to talk to climate deniers, people like Donald Trump, is they don't want to listen, so it doesn't really matter what you say. So I don't think I'm ever going to say anything that's going to convince them. Um, because I think the basis on which they're saying that is not scientific. So they're not open to a scientific logical argument. Uh, thank you. You mentioned early in your talk that you worked on wave power. Yep. Until the Iron Lady stopped you. <laughs> um, do you think that we have a, a, a reasonable future of getting energy from wave power? And do you think we ought to get back into pursuing what you did earlier? Oh, well, there's lots of projects going on with wave power, but wave power is actually a very difficult problem engineering-wise. Theoretically, it's fine. I can't a theoretician, so from my point of view, it's perfect. Um, the problem with wave power is, um, I don't know if you've ever been snorkeling or scuba diving, but the wave motion that you feel at the surface 
decays with depth. So if you're about 20 meters down, you can hardly feel the waves, even if there are big waves. So all the energy is in the waves is near the surface, but it's also where things get smashed up. Hence the interest in road waves, because one expected a large wave just smash things up. So the problem is an engineering problem, whether you can build something robust enough that will sit in the surface waters, because that's where the energy is, um, and absorb energy. So theoretically, yes. And there are people working on it. There are experimental wave there's a testing test place off Scotland, I think the newest or something, I can't remember the exact location. All of the islands of Scotland where they do tests on these. So people are working on that. I think for our country, um, it's never going to provide huge amounts of energy. I think wind power and solar power are probably a better way to go in terms of engineering and what you can do. Um, there are places around the world that do actually small islands that have implemented wave power because they don't need a huge amount and um, they're placing other waves. I think it's a tough engineering problem. Um, doing it on a small scale is different to doing it on a large scale. But is, it, is there a difference between tidal power and wave power? Because waves are notoriously fickle, aren't they? Yeah. As you suggested, I think. But surely tide, tidal <laughs> power, is, are we not trying to harvest, harvest that? Or is that no, no, I mean, um, tides are waves. They're just waves on a much bigger scale and work slightly differently because they're due to the moon and the sun's forces acting on the earth. So tidal power was, has been around as long as the wave power. When I was doing my PhD um, in the 70s, there was talk of the Bristol Tidal Barrage because the, the um, Bristol Channel has got the largest tidal range. And the problem is there are huge ecological impacts of doing something like that. What's more interesting, and I'm not sure it's been implemented, is the idea of just sitting turbines on the seabed in not too deep water and just letting the tides go through the turbines twice a day. The problem is, of course, you generate power at the maximum tidal flow, which may not be when you want it. And the issue is whether you can store power. Um, and that's an issue that um, we haven't cracked yet. And there's a place in Scotland, I think it's one in Wales as well, one in quiet times where there's lots of electricity, they pump water to the top of a hill. And then when there's lack of power, they let the water down. The trouble is, um, we visited, I chatted to the guy and he said, basically, we can do this, it worked for about 24 hours, then we run out of water. So if you know, in the World Cup final, and, and people come out in the half time to put the kettles on, uh, they can cope with that surge of power for half an hour, pump water, then let the water come down and generate electricity. But storing the power is the problem, so you get tidal flows twice, strong tidal flows twice a day, or whatever. But what do you, how do you store the power? That's the, Thank you. Can I be a bit more esoteric? Yeah, sure. Um, we wouldn't have this problem if there weren't people. <laughs> well, we, could, we, could, we could wipe out the human race. That is a potential solution. And, and if we wouldn't have the problem if it hadn't been for the land plants generating the oxygen in the first place. <laughs> you, you haven't mentioned plants in the sea. How much effect do vegetation in the sea have uh, to help or hinder the problems that you've been describing? Well, I talked about plankton and the, 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 um, the ocean absorbing carbon dioxide. There are two methods by which the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide. One is just solubility, so the CO2 dissolves in the water and makes it more acidic. But with the carbon dioxide in the water, the plants that grow in the water, the plankton, the phytoplankton, use that carbon. So that's they're called a biological pump. Um, and that's also uh, acts to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that it is having an effect on the plants, and the plants, phytoplankton in the ocean, are absorbing lots of carbon dioxide. And then zooplankton eat them, and fish they eat them. So it goes into the food chain, some of them die, go to the seabed. So yeah, there is a, there is a process going into, yeah, on there as well. And that's why people want to do ocean fertilization when they want to stick iron in, because there are some places where plankton don't grow very well because there's not enough iron in the water and then get the plankton to grow and absorb more CO2. Unfortunately, that is also, um, we don't know what the consequences of that are. You're messing with the bottom of the food chain. Um, you know, and it's also not clear whether the ecosystem will come into balance because if there's more 
phytoplankton, we tend to get more zooplankton, which eats them, which means the phytoplankton don't grow. So it's, it's not straightforward, but you're right, the plants in the ocean do use the CO2. And that's part of why 26% uh, of the CO2 is being absorbed in the ocean. Part of it's just dissolving, well, part of it's dissolving and then being used by the plants, just like plants on land absorb CO2. So we have two more questions. We've got another one over there? Yes? Anybody this side? You've been a bit quiet this side. <laughs> I was very interested when you showed your slide about your very learned polar bears <laughs> saying uh, that it's humans. Yeah. Well, we know that humans produce carbon dioxide 24 hours a day. We know that humans produce 5 kilowatts of heat 24 hours a day. And we know also that from your, from your graph that you put up, which showed the exponential increase in temperature, that 19, from the 1960s, that actually mi mirrors the image of the global population, which, if you take the 1960s, that coincides with the introduction of the pill on the prescription. <laughs> do you think, do you foresee a time in the future when the, when the global population will become an issue for climate change? Well, we already are, because um, the global population is what's burning oil, coal, and gas. As human beings, we don't actually, you know, compared to the sort of scale of uh, CO2 and heating that, that, this, that we're doing by putting um, CO2 into the atmosphere from fossil fuels, we're, we're a blip in that. But a larger population means more industrialization because people all want a better lifestyle. The better lifestyle, you have to industrialize and make things. Um, you don't necessarily have to go down that route. If you go to Bhutan, I don't know if you've heard of Bhutan, it's a little country in the Himalayas, and there they've decided they're going to go for gross national happiness rather than gross national product as their measure of success. And I think one of the problems we have is that we are a consumer society. I mean, not just us, but globally. And people want, you know, if you are a poor person in Africa, you would quite like our lifestyle. But to have our lifestyle, we need to burn more CO2 burn more fossil fuels. So I think one of the things that would help is if we had a, you know, we had a smaller population um, globally. Um, that will happen, I think, in time. But whether it will happen fast enough, given the speed at which we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere, I don't know. But um, you know, if you reduce the population of the planet to 2 billion, we could all probably live quite comfortable lifestyles um, without putting huge amounts of CO2 because we could probably do solar, wind, and other powers, but I don't know at the moment. I think the population is predicted to peak at about 9 billion and then start to decrease. Um, but I'm not a population expert. So, right. well, I think that's, uh, that's been a, a good ramble through some very wide-ranging uh, topics. So now, let's talk about uh, our, patch. our patch of the ocean and our patch of the world. The Atlantic and our climate. Mm. Okay, so this is a classic, it's called the conveyor belt picture of the ocean circulation. Um, it was um, came out by a guy called Wally Broker, a very famous paleo oceanographer based on things like sediment cores and past climates. Um, it's a very simplified picture, I'll explain why, but in, in principle, what it's showing is that uh, in the Atlantic, warm water goes north, cools because it's giving up heat to the atmosphere, like I said sinks and comes back as a deep cold current and this whole sort of conveyor belt structure around the world um, and then weather systems coming across the Atlantic pick up that heat. The Atlantic is unusual in, um, I'm not sure about this picture, but it, uh, it's unusual in that heat goes, normally heat moves from the equator to the poles um, in the ocean, but in the Atlantic it's going from the South Atlantic to the North Atlantic. Atlantic is an unusual ocean uh, for, in many respects. So then you get stories like this, I mean, they're a bit old now. I haven't seen one recently, so I think this one was 2018. Um, but you get stories like this, is the Gulf Stream about to collapse? Who's seen the day after tomorrow in the film? Yeah, that's sort of, you know, so. There's a popular sort of um, imagination thing. Um, possibly slightly more uh, measured climate change denials down the Atlantic Ocean heating system. So, just going back to my plot. The point is that, um, if you uh, do global warming, then you warm the ocean. Therefore, although it may cool, it may not cool enough for the water to sink. 
added to which you've got uh, Greenland melting, adding fresh water, which makes the water less dense, which stops it sinking. You've got a warmer atmosphere. A warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture, um, hence you get more rainfall at high latitudes, and that adds fresh water as well. Um, so all those processes might disrupt this conveyor belt system. I should say that the ocean circulation is a lot more complicated. So this is the conveyor belt picture we've done. This is driven by changes in heat and fresh water input. Um, uh, fresh water affects how salty the ocean is and that affects how dense the water can get. Um, there's another um, part of the circulation which is driven by the wind fields, just driven the water in. So even if this circulation collapsed, you would still have things like a Gulf Stream, because the, it's unless the winds change considerably, because the winds drive circulation that would include the Gulf Stream. It's not possible to decouple these uh, circulations in practice, it's much too complicated. Uh, but it's um, conceptually useful to think of them in that way. So this is some data from a uh, cruise I was on. I told you I was interested, this is South Africa, this is Madagascar. Um, I was interested in, there's an Agulhas current, it's a very strong current that runs down the side of uh, South Africa, um, and there's currents around Madagascar. They bring warm water into the South Atlantic and a part of that global circulation. But as you can see, the circulation is not that nice, smooth um, conveyor belt. It's uh, complicated, it's full of eddies, so this will just repeat. Um, so the satellite picture um, is using uh, passive microwave um, instruments from space. Unfortunately, the land in, in that uh, part of the microwave spectrum is very bright, so you can't actually make a measurement near the land because the land uh, contaminates the measurement, which is why there's all this white around the land. Um, so the temperatures you can see is much warmer up here in the Indian Ocean, much cooler down here in the Southern Ocean, and the warm waters comes around the tip of the South. Africa. So this is in 2005. When we were there on a cruise south of Madagascar, we deployed some buoys which are satellite tracked. The tail of the buoy represents the last 10 days of where it's been. Um, sorry, it should all repeat again. Yeah. So you can see there in eddies, there's all sorts of eddy structures, all sorts of small scale behaviour. Um, they don't, you know, what flow is the nice smooth flow around South Africa. So it's very complicated to try to understand the ocean circulation is tricky. So the one that one gets in the Agulhas current, which is actually in the white bit that we're not measuring because of the satellite instrument, it goes quite quickly because the Agulhas current is just... No, I just want to show you that to show you that the ocean is quite a complicated place. That conveyor belt picture is useful conceptually, but it's not really accurate in terms of what we understand about the ocean. I think John was involved in some of the early research on eddies. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, not with satellite data. Yeah. <laughs> but we, Current meter. Current meter, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, just going back to our bit of the world, so here we are, the UK. <clears throat> if you look at this latitude circle as you go around, so this is January 1993, you get a very similar picture for most Januarys. Um, this is the latitude circle at which we are all the way around. You can see in North America it's a lot colder in winter, and also once you get into Europe and uh, Russia it's very cold. Um, but we have relatively mild winter temperatures. We're about 10 degrees warmer than similar places on that latitude circle. And that's because as the warm water moves north in the Atlantic, the weather systems crossing the Atlantic, which cross from um, west to east, pick up heat and moisture, which gives us our mild and wet winters. Um, but we have very uh, mild winters because of this. So you can think that if the circulation were to slow down and stop, that would affect our local climate, our local weather systems quite significantly. <coughs> I just want to make a point about average temperatures. So when I talk about climate change, people say it's two degree temperature rise, that's great, we can grow grapes in some of the vineyards. Two degrees doesn't seem like a lot. <coughs> the problem is that it's not a uniform rise in temperature. So this is my simple example of that. In this planet, the northern hemisphere is cooled by six degrees, and the southern hemisphere is warmed by 10 degrees. 10 minus six is four, two hemispheres, so the average is four divided by two, which is a two degree temperature rise globally. But if you're in the minus six or the plus 10, your experience of a two degree global warming will be very different. And that's an important point when thinking about global warming. It will not be a nice uniform temperature rise of two degrees everywhere. Some places will get a lot hotter and some places will get a lot colder. 
And this is a computer model simulation of uh, slowing down, or uh, I can't remember, I think it's a slow down scenario. You slow down that circulation uh, in the model, and then you take the difference between uh, normal conditions and the slow down conditions, and this is the difference in surface temperature due to the slow down. As you can see, there's a significant cooling of several degrees in our part of the Atlantic. It doesn't mean global warming is stopped, it just means that the southern hemisphere is heated up, so the heat has gone somewhere else. So that's an important point. You know, two degrees is a bit misleading. Depending on where you are in this scenario, you'd have a very different experience of global warming. Uh, more problematic, probably not so much for us, but for certain parts of Africa, this is the change in uh, rainfall, precipitation. And what happens is the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, which is a rainfall band in, in the uh, tropics, moves north-south. And so you get uh, more rainfall than less rainfall. If you're in sub-Saharan Africa or somewhere in here, and your rainfall moves five degrees south, which on a global scale is not very much, it could move into the next country. Um, there are some real issues. So we will see changes, but they won't be nice uniform two degrees everywhere type changes. Another calculation <coughs> that was done by one of my colleagues, this is uh, with the circulation on and the circulation off, and storm tracks. So these are the sort of uh, places where the storms track normally, and then you get much stronger and which uh, storms travel much further into Europe. So you can change the storm in these conditions, and we're already beginning to see some of these changes. Uh, the prediction will be that you'll get more intense rainfall, and we've seen that with some of the flooding we're getting. And you also get more droughts, which we're not seeing, but places in Africa are. So this is the observed surface temperature um, between 1901 and 2012, the change uh, in degree C. And practically everywhere has warmed. Some places have warmed more than others. And there in the North Atlantic, there's a little blue blob, which is we think is probably due to the slowdown of the circulation. So uh, things have not warmed quite as fast. It doesn't mean the planet hasn't warmed, it just means that the temperature distribution is not even. So uh, what I'm involved in have been since uh, the early 2000s, the program of World Rapid, because there was some concern from computer modeling and theoretical understanding that the uh, ocean circulation could slow down or collapse over a decadal timescale. Normally we think of 100 years for climate change. I was concerned this uh, ice core data and sediment data where you can track past changes, paleoclimate, um, where there is some indication that changes occur on timescales of a decade, which is very fast, cloudically. So the, we didn't know what the ocean circulation was doing. There have been measurements, and I'll explain about those in a minute before this. But in 2004, this program was funded to observe um, the ocean circulation at 26, 26.5 degrees north. Again, this is this very simplified schematic of the circulation and the weather systems. And we've been funded now to 2008, then a second lot to 2014, 2020, and now we're up to 2025. This is working with National Science Foundation and National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the USA and the Natural Environment Research Council in this country funds it. So what we're trying to do is work out whether the ocean circulation is changing. And prior to this, this circulation at this latitude, and this is one of the best observed latitudes, had been observed. We started in 2004. There have been uh, three more uh, cyclical sections across the ocean. There was 57, 81, 92, 98, 2004. So very few observations. This is one of the best observed by ship. So you take a ship and you start at one end of the Atlantic. This is the widest point of the Atlantic as well, which obviously doesn't help. Um, it takes longer to get across. And those little crosses represent the ship. The ship stops every 50 kilometers and lowers an instrument called the CTD, which measures temperature and salinity, essentially. And then you can construct um, the temperature and salinity structure of the ocean and work out what's happening in terms of the flow north-south. So you've got warm water flowing north near the surface and cold water. So you get typical plots like this, I can't remember, I think this might be from the 2004 cruise, I might be wrong. But you can see the bathymetry of the Atlantic, this is the mid-Atlantic ridge, uh, very steep topography near the Bahamas, and less steep topography near Africa. So it takes about 35 days and about 25 scientists on the ship, 25 crew. So this is not an option for continuous observations. Um, so what um, some of my colleagues came up with 
was uh, an array. So we were not going to measure everywhere, we were going to measure at the eastern and western boundary uh, and uh, near the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, and this was deployed uh, in 2004 and been measuring ever since. And I'll tell you a bit more about how that all works. Uh, so the ocean here is about five kilometers deep. So we are putting in moorings with instruments to measure temperature and salinity and currents. So this is the Empire State in the Eiffel Tower. So this is the mooring. It's about five kilometers of wire. The little yellow things on the instruments and the buoyancy uh, spheres are not to scale. Maybe, you, know, you wouldn't be able to see them if I didn't scale. It's just to give you an idea of the sort of where they are on the uh, on the mooring, so they're distributed on the mooring. So we put these out um, we can make measurements, and we're using a principle called geostrophy, basically from Greek meaning geo of the earth and strophy turning, which you will be familiar with if you ever watch the weather forecast and look at a, a pressure map. So essentially, uh, fluid should flow from high pressure to low pressure. But because the Earth is rotating, it actually flows at right angles. So if you look on your uh, weather charts, you've got high pressures, low pressures, but the flow is along the isobars because of this, because of the rotation of the Earth. And there's a very, I think, bipolar or something in the 19th century. If the wind is at your back, the low pressure is on the left. So although the flow is trying to go from high pressure to low pressure, the uh, rotation makes it go at right angles. So that's very simple physics. So if we had, I'm just going back to this plot. If, if the ocean was just a, a, a nice rectangular section, we could just measure at one side and the other <laughs> and work out what the flow was at different levels. Unfortunately, you've got topography in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, so it's a bit more complicated. But essentially, that's what we're doing. That's what we're using. So I think the next thing is the video. So I'll play the video and uh, you need to see what we do. The North Atlantic is particularly sensitive to changes in temperature and salinity. The circulation here is complex and known as the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. The circulation brings warm water towards northwestern Europe. As it does, it releases heat to the atmosphere. The heat transferred is equivalent to one million power stations and helps ensure Europe's temperate climate. As warm surface waters move north and cool, cold water returns south at depth, completing the circulation. Mount Tidy, on the island of Tenerife, the highest point in the Atlantic Ocean. Scientists are on the island for the start of the rapid climate change expedition. They'll spend the next month deploying an array of 22 scientific moorings across the Atlantic between Africa and the tip of Miami. The instruments will measure the overturning circulation on a daily basis. Until this expedition, scientists had little idea how this circulation varied year on year, let alone every day. They sail along latitude 26.5 degrees north. This is where the ocean transports most heat northwards. Preparations are underway to deploy a mooring. Instruments and buoys are attached to cables that stream out behind the ship. This takes many hours. Give you a shout when the first boys are over. Finally, they release the anchor. Another 2,000 kilometers and the scientists reach the continent. 
continental shelf of the United States. After deploying the array, the researchers return once more across the Atlantic. This time they stop every 50 kilometers and lower instruments to the seabed five kilometers below. This takes many hours. The instruments sample the water at different depths. Unlike the array deployed earlier, which will provide continuous daily measurements of the circulation, these instruments are hauled back to the surface once they've captured the various water samples. These samples provide a valuable reference point for the new array. This is only the fifth such transatlantic snapshot taken since 1957. After a year of constant operation, the scientists retrieve the instruments. This is a tense time. Will the instruments resurface as instructed? Or has a year under immense pressure proved too much? It sometimes takes a whole day to locate and retrieve a mooring. Scientists waste no time checking each instrument and recovering the valuable data. It's a success. Most instruments work perfectly. The team have now pieced together the first year's data. On the 17th of August 2007, the Rapid Climate Change Program announced the first continuous daily measurements of the strength of the overturning circulation in two landmark papers in the American journal Science. It seems the circulation varies considerably from day to day, much more than expected. Policymakers and researchers are already using the results, and it has inspired educators and artists, writers and filmmakers. As you can see, it's uh, rather old because it talks about 2007 papers we've done all since then. Well, let me show you some results. <coughs> So we measured the circulation in a unit called the Spurdrup. Spurdrup was a famous oceanographer of, uh, I can't remember what it was in? Swedish, yeah. Norwegian. Norwegian? Swedish. I don't know, anyway. Um, uh, he was a famous oceanographer. And a Spurdrup is a cubic, cube, 10 to the 6 um, meters, per, meters cubed per second of water. If you add up all the global river discharge into the ocean, that's about one Spurdrup. So what we found, when we started measuring, we started measuring in 2004, and in the first few years we found, um, you can see an annual cycle very clearly, and you can see that the ocean circulation is decreasing <coughs> over that period, which is what computer models predicted, except that this decrease is much faster than the models were predicting. And then in 2009-10, we found a much a more unexpected large dip in the circulation for, a sh for that winter, for a short period of time. And then since then, sadly, it's been a bit boring, it's been flat. Um, so uh, this was a faster decline than expected from the uh, climate models. This was completely unexpected, nobody knew the circulation could do that. Um, and now we seem to be in a fairly we seem to have lost the annual cycle for reasons that aren't entirely obvious. Um, but the circulation is relatively flat. It's not, you know, there is some variability from year to year, but it doesn't appear to be increasing. From the computer models of climate, we know that we probably need at least 20 to 40 years observations to determine whether it's really going down. So we need to know whether it will continue or will it go down or come back up. We don't know. We need to 
It's a signal to noise problem for those who know about signal to noise because the climate varies anyway for lots of different reasons. To detect the change, uh, you need to have a, either a sufficiently long record or it has to happen very quickly. If this had carried on, we'd have been sure that it was um, declining because decline, this is a very rapid change compared to what climate models are suggesting a change, but much, much, uh, much slower. So we need to kind of keep observing, even though we've got um, 18 years of data. Um, my colleagues are actually out on a cruise at the moment, retrieving the uh, moorings off um, Africa, not Africa, off America, off the Bahamas. So what happened is, so this is the depth, 1800 meters, and 2004 to 2012. And because of that dip and the decline, you can see that this is a change in the temperature of the upper ocean, which we can now measure with things called Argo floats, which I won't explain in any detail. But there's been a huge cooling um, after the slowdown, and that seems to have persisted in the upper ocean. So there's been a change in the upper ocean temperatures in the North Atlantic. And um, in, I don't know whether people remember the 2009-10 winter, um, this picture is unusual for two reasons. One is that you can actually see the UK winter from space, usually it's cloud covered so you can't see anything. And secondly, the whole of the UK from north to south is covered in snow. Now, um, various factors contributed to the cold winter, but the slowdown of the ocean circulation is probably one of the factors that contributed. So because this is really expensive, and this is the widest part of the Atlantic, we've had to think carefully more recently, because there's less money available than there used to be uh, for doing this. Uh, but this array is quite extensive, and it takes quite a long time, especially going to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So we have now come up with a revised from 2010, December 2020, we have an array where we're only measuring at the boundaries, because we found that the measurements on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge um, by removing those, we do get a slightly less accurate measurement, but it's, um, still accurate enough to detect a decline. So we are not doing that, which means we can do two short, rather than spending um, 35 days or whatever going across the middle of the Atlantic, we can just spend a few days doing this and a few days doing that. So we're working with the Americans and using American ships for this end, using British ships at this end, because we're working with American colleagues in Miami. So we've changed all that and we're monitoring it the circulation has declined um, as compared to what it was when we started measuring. It's definitely lower, but we don't know whether it will continue to decline or not. And therefore, we need to keep measuring. So my ambition um, is to measure the AMOP for 20 to 40 years. We're going to hit the 20-year mark. Whether we'll hit the 40-year mark, I don't know. I shall probably be dead in 20 years' time. I don't know. <laughs> so but the challenge that we have, which is one that we face all the time, is how to do this in a cost-effective manner because the powers that be are uh, not, not being very generous in terms of the funding at the moment, um, which is not surprising given the whole we have in the UK finances. Um, so that's my ambition, um, and I'll hand over to you for questions. Thank you very much for listening. <coughs>